make sense. And ideally, if you um, switch to side-by-side -side mode, it should be uh, helpful to see, I think, both the person who's speaking, whether that's Alice or me, um, as well as the presentation. Okay, to get us started, the good news is all of you know the format, seem to have either coached or judged in the format or debated in it. So I'm going to spend very little time going through the format itself, but we'll just do a quick brush through on the basics of the format. Um, as you all know, um, because you've judged in the W, sorry, debated, coached, or judged in the WTC format, this is broadly the flow of the round. Um, eight minute speeches, six speakers in the room, but eight speeches because the first or second speaker can deliver, um, well, one of the two must uh, deliver a reply speech, um, and that's four minutes long. Uh, you can offer points of information in the speeches colored green because uh, those are constructive or substantive speeches. Those are constructive or substantive because you can have new material, either arguments or rebuttal in those speeches relative to reply speeches where there's nothing new. And as a result, no points of information from the other team um, can be raised. So this is something I think all of us already know. Um, and so very quickly, a minute on either end is protected. Six minutes in the middle is unprotected where POIs can be asked in uh, constructive or substantive speeches. Uh, as we know, a POI is a short interjection from a speaking member of the team, uh, from a speaking member of the team that is not currently speaking or holding the flow. So if I am first prop and I'm speaking, one of the speaking members from opposition can raise a point of information. Uh, very quickly, this is relevant to judging. So overall, in terms of accepting points of information in your six sub substantive speeches, uh, one is judges, because they're responsible for managing the room, should make sure that each speaker, right before their speech, lets the room know if they prefer their POI through audio um, or through chat, and just check in that teams are following whatever the speaker's preference is. And then obviously the speaker who has the floor has the right to refuse POIs, but in general should accept about two POIs. So this is not like a hard and fast rule, but is the recommendation across years that a speaker take two points of information. If a speaker accepts the points of information, they should give the person offering adequate time to express their comment or question. So what's important is the little green box down there which is what happens from a judge's perspective if a speaker takes no POIs or takes less than two POIs. So how would you treat that? And we've got the answer to this FAQ, which is the decision of the overall round, regardless of how many POIs are taken or not, should be evaluated by the content that's coming out in that round. However, teams that take POIs are advantaged and often might implicitly in their content score have a higher score because they are able to engage the other team's material more. Judges can also reflect in an individual speaker's score the fact that they took two POIs. So if you are giving someone a 71 and you realize they didn't take a point of information, you can bump them down by half a point. However, the overall decision should not be swayed by your cutting of that half a point if that team is winning regardless of that speaker taking a POI or not. And therefore, you judge the overall round with the content that has come out, but you factor in the quality of POIs, whether POIs were taken and POI responses in individual speakers' scores after the decision has already made, if that make, has already been made, if that makes sense. Um, in terms of offering, in terms of room management, uh, we usually want only one speaker from the opposing side to ask at a time. Non-speaking members can't offer POIs, especially in rooms with new teams. This might be a source of confusion. Uh, speakers shouldn't, in, uh, shouldn't indicate uh, anything else but POI when they ask a POI, and they should wait 20 seconds before asking uh, the next POI. So broadly, that's just some house cleaning management um, judging stuff uh, for points of information. Um, obviously, you've all encountered WSTC motions. They're all phrased as this house, something, something, taking after parliamentary debating. Uh, we just wanted to do a quick few minutes specifically on team and speaker roles because judging to a large extent depends on our understanding of the roles of teams and speakers. 
Overall, a prop team has to set up the debate through a clear definition and characterization. They have to advance strong constructive arguments in favor of their case. So why should we pass this motion? And where appropriate, based on the motion type, might identify a problem and explain how their policy or motion solves that problem. Alternatively, they might say, this is the world without X. Why is the world with X better than the world without X? On the other hand, opposition obviously has to oppose the motion, can purely set up a case that is based entirely on rebutting proposition. Usually this is strategically risky. So let's say um, the topic is this house of ban smoking. Opposition can entirely set up a case that goes banning smoking is bad without their own explanation for why smokers might be better off in the op world. This is usually pretty risky. Um, and that often means opposition teams also bring their own constructive or substantive arguments. However, whether they do that or not is not an auto win or loss. Nothing is an auto win or loss. You have to evaluate the debate as a whole. So um, I'll just give you guys a minute to run through the roles of speakers on prop and op. First speakers usually definition a model based on the debate type. Um, they advance two strong constructive arguments usually and are the team that also are the speaker that also flags what the division of material is between their speakers. Very similar from the perspective of first opposition, except they also have to rebut first proposition. Uh, second speakers obviously rebut earlier material, defend their own team's material, uh, and then extend constructive argumentation. Both third speakers can have constructive arguments if first speakers announce that as part of the case split. However, in practice, this hardly ever happens in WSDC. And the norm that is followed, even though the technical rule is different, is that third speakers never have new constructive arguments in their speeches. However, third speakers do have new rebuttal. It is their job. They have to rebut the material coming from the previous speaker, defend the material that earlier speakers have rebutted, um, the material that their own side presented. Um, we have a little bit in the next couple of slides on third and reply speeches that are special notes from the CAD. I'll let Alice just cover those two. But finally, before we move to that, reply speeches bring a holistic view of the debate. That means teams are pretending like their reply speakers are a judge. So they will do something like, this is the debate that has happened. These are the two most important questions. Here's what prop said. Here's what op said. Here is how op's material interacts with prop. At the end, was that good enough to win? Was that inadequate and therefore does prop win? So that's the sort of biased summary they do based on whichever team they are debating that uh, motion from. And they are allowed new material as long as it is derivative. So what does that mean? They can have new examples that support points that were earlier made by their team members. They have new observations on the debate. So things like opposition responded with this, but that was unresponsive to the context that first prop already set up. So that is an observation in the round that they might be introducing that earlier speakers haven't introduced, and that is allowed. However, what they can't do is introduce new rebuttal or new arguments in their reply speeches. Um, just checking that you're all with me so far. So we're just going to go into some detail about evaluating the contribution of third speakers and reply speakers in WSDC, because that is always a question and um, CA teams have to release clarifications on those. So before we jump into that, I just wanted to check if there are any questions on what I've talked through already. Uh, I guess I would like to ask um, in regards to um, opposition, like setting the strategic or getting the using the strategy to only oppose proposition, would that affect their st strategy points? And if we see them do that, do we give them less uh, strategy points or is it all entirely dependent on how the debate goes? Yeah, so that's a really good question. There's two ways to think about this. First is you evaluate the debate as it goes, decide who the winner is. After you decide the winner, you can independently score down opposition for things like they did this, but strategically having a constructive case will have meant that they had better material in the round. So maybe content based on how well analyzed they were in that rebuttal or strategy based on how risky it was or how inconsistent they might have been. Um, 
are things that you can reflect in their individual speaker scores. But that will then mean that proposition scores should be even worse than that overall in the debate, if that makes sense. Okay, thank you. Uh, the one thing I will say, and now you will go, Vashni, but you just said you can do that before, because I guess the answer is depends. But there is a world where opposition gets called out for this, right? Where prop goes, really, what is your solution to make things better? And there is a world where opposition comes back on that and explains why they don't need a solution to make things better as long as they aren't making things worse. The world as it is is better. That could be good strategy in that instance. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Um, okay, so just hopping on to the next slide. Alice, just checking in that you're here and if you'd walk, walk through um, third speakers and the CAP guide on third speakers. Yes, I am. Can I check that I'm audible? Everyone can see and hear me? Okay, cool. So let's dive in a little deeper on the third speaker, uh, on the third speaker speeches. So uh, Varshini already covered uh, a bit of it, so uh, about new materials, but uh, what I think is very important to flag here, uh, it's how we define if a thing that came in a third speaker, uh, in a third speaker is actually new material or not. So I think there's a few things that third speakers can do that aren't new material and are, are potentially new to the debate. So, for example, a third speaker can uh, provide a direct rebuttal uh, to, to arguments that other teams have made. So uh, if the rebuttal wasn't previously mentioned by uh, the, the other speakers, that's fine, because uh, basically what the third speaker is doing in that case is engaging with what happened in the debate. And in the same way, uh, third speakers can also provide new lines of waiting. So uh, just basically putting together arguments that came both from proposition and opposition and providing new reasons on why that argument should be weighted against another one. This is not making a new argument. It's basically just giving reasons on why one should be uh, weighted higher than, than the other. Uh, and also, uh, I think another thing that we should uh, pay attention of is that third speakers can also do a bit of meta debating. So, for example, uh, kind of analyzing how things that happen interact with each other. So uh, they can provide things like saying uh, th they can provide things like saying, "Oh, uh, this argument that came from the other side wasn't uh, fully analyzed," and things like that. That would be basically making comments in the debate. That's not new material. Uh, is basically just fulfilling their role. And uh, on arguments that uh, are already uh, in the debate, uh, what third speakers can uh, specifically do is, for example, provide new examples. So uh, if an argument was, uh, was presented by their team with some kind of characterization and some kind of example, a third speaker can provide a new one to thus make this argument stronger. Uh, this would be commonly used uh, in cases where the argument was, for example, rebutted by the other team uh, or uh, discontextualized by the other team. So the third speaker uh, is in absolutely right to provide uh, new examples of a thing that was already proven by their teams, uh, as well as, for example, new contextualizations and new characterizations on why that argument would be relevant or important for the round. I think the, the main rule of thumb here uh, is basically that they can add substantial weight to the debate. They can uh, they can analyze how the things that they said their team said uh, were strong or are, are still existing in the debate by providing new arguments. And they can also uh, show us how that interacts with things that were uh, brought to the other side. So those wouldn't be completely new ideas. Uh, those would simply be a comments on how things uh, interact and how things uh, that were presented are still uh, are are still relevant. So uh, the fact that a third speaker is bringing something that wasn't said in the debate in the debate doesn't mean that he is bringing a uh, new material to the debate. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Uh, yeah. Or can we move to the next slide? Everything okay? Cool. 
So uh, basically, uh, this is about what I was saying. So uh, new uh, new arguments by itself aren't permissible, uh, but the fact the, the fact that they are adding this uh, substantial bits doesn't mean that this is uh, necessarily uh, a new argument. So if they are providing a completely new and independent line of argumentation that wasn't already presented in the debate or uh, wasn't a flag in the uh, wasn't wasn't flagged in the uh, in the in the debate yet that would be new material and i think uh, it's very helpful uh to understand the logic behind this rule uh, to make it easier for us to identify when a material is new because uh basically the logic behind it uh, uh behind this is the fact that if the, the argument came too late in the round, it would be very hard for the other teams uh, to be able to respond and engage with it. So any kind of new material uh, that uh, is potentially very new and wouldn't pass unresponded simply because the teams wouldn't have the chance uh, to make an argument or to to kind of wait that thing uh, is potentially more damaging, more, more damaging to, 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 to the debate. Uh, so if the first speaker, for example, explicitly is flagging that this material will come, that means that teams would have this opportunity to actually, uh, that, that, that means that teams would have the opportunity to, to interact with that material uh, before uh, the third speaker uh, came because they knew that this material would exist. So uh, just pay attention and I think uh, uh, just to a bit of interact to a thing that was a common concern uh, between you all that was kind of tracking uh, the debate and taking notes, we'll probably uh, dive in deeper, uh, deeper in that point. But I think uh, what is very important to aim as a judge is to have clear uh, what were the case of the teams, even if you uh, are not picking uh, specifically uh, what lines they said to prove it or things like that. Uh, but when you have the case from the team clear and you have clear uh, what were what was specifically proved, what was analyzed, it's much easier to recognize if a third speaker uh, is bringing a new material to the debate uh, or, uh, or uh, any material to the debate or not, because uh, you were already clear from the other speakers. So, Varshini, uh, I think yeah, over I just to you. I wanted to really, really quickly add that one of the benefits of confederal judging, which is that you have the benefit of asking clarificatory questions before you make your final decision, is that you can actually quickly check in going, I got this bit from third opposition. Can I check that this was said earlier in the debate? And did you guys count that as a new argument? And it would be useful for you to get that perspective um, from someone else that's uh, sitting in the room and judging with you. So that's one of the benefits and it's something that you should feel free to do if you've got any questions around this while in a room that's uh, judging. Obviously, the little green box at the bottom, what happens if a critical portion of the opposition rebuttal is delivered by third op without any engagement from first and second? Can op still win the debate? The answer is yes, op can theoretically win uh, by responding thoroughly to an issue that their first and second speakers have not responded to or did not respond enough to. This is arguably, however, bad strategy, given prop has the opportunity to build more onto the point and make it stronger, which will make it hard for third to really conclusively respond to that point, but also because it reduces the thoroughness with which a third speaker can respond to other issues in the round. And um, just in terms of thinking about decisions and scoring, in terms of a decision, a team that is an op team that does this might still win a round. But in terms of scoring, there is a world where first and second prop are marked down for their strategy and third op is marked up for their ability to both get all that material through in a third speech um, and content. Um, okay, so was that all good so far? And can we just quickly move to reply speakers? Hi, uh, can I ask? Yes, um, of course. So, so uh, if... Uh, for new substantive uh, in third speaker for arguments. So even if it's only a line of assertion only in the first speaker or second speaker, and they say that the uh, more explanation and reasonings will be explained in third speaker, and like all new uh, uh, reasonings is uh, and analysis is all and examples in other speaker, as long as it's being flagged and it's already an assumption in first or second, uh, it is still permissible. Okay, 
So this is yeah. a good question and the real answer is de it depends, but I'll just give you an example of what is it isn't permissible. First is regardless of flagging or not flagging, something that is brand new, but also takes up a chunk of third speaker's time and is critical to the way that team's case operates should not be coming for the first time at third speech. That's the first thing to say. Second is, what do we mean by flagging? So if you are first speaker and you say our team has four arguments and you go, I will do the first, my second speaker will do say the second and third, our third speaker will extend the elaboration by doing a small portion. Only if you say it that way upfront in your case split, is it even in consideration? And even then it has to be a small portion. The third thing to say is if you have just said a line somewhere, throw away line and your third speaker is doing all the work in making that line into a paragraph, two paragraphs. One is, have they made those two paragraphs responsive to material that existed in the debate? If they've managed to do that, then that should be credited. But if that is standalone new material, then even if there was a one-line assertion earlier, that is not enough for you to make the decision that an earlier speaker has been credited with making some part of this argument and will probably be discounted on that basis. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you so much. And I, and I think to just quickly jump in on a useful way of thinking about that uh, is that when you engage with an argument, you are not simply engaging with the claim of the argument, but with the analysis that was provided to back that argument up. So with the reasons on why they said that assertion was true, if those reasons came only very, very late in the round, it means that your ability to engage with that argument was severely damaged because you didn't know the reasons that would back that up. So you couldn't respond to that. So uh, that's the logic behind uh, simply asserting an argument uh, isn't enough, making it allowed to be brought by only the third speaker. Yeah. However, because third speakers are allowed to and should in fact, and are only good third speakers if they do new rebuttal, reply speakers also have the ability therefore to respond to that in some ways, even if not as full-fledged new rebuttal. So what do we mean? And here I'm just referring to the CAP guide on the role of reply speeches. Um, they are a crucial part of the debate and they can swing the result of the debate. So they swing the result of the debate in two ways. First is they often can remind you of things that you might have forgotten that earlier speakers have said because their job is to highlight and report on the debate that happened. So based on what a reply speaker has brought to you, you could flip back through your notes and check and realize that they've actually said that thing that you might have mentally missed out. And that can play a role in getting you to reevaluate who you think has won around. But second is reply speakers, especially proposition reply, really is the only speaker that has the ability to do anything about third op and op reply that go one after the other. So some new things in reply are permitted. They can't be new arguments. They can't be new rebuttal, but they can be new weighing framing there can be new contextual observations, uh, examples. So things like material that has been brought in a later speech, the fact that that material does not clash with the context that prop has already set up. That's something a reply speaker can point out and give a couple of reasons for. Or reply speakers can, can give examples that strengthen the points that they've earlier made. So these are all ways in which a reply speaker can add value and should add value to the debate because no good reply speaker's job is to be a news reporter that reads out what happens. It is their job to give you a biased evaluation of the debate that will try and sway your mind to vote for their team. So particularly close debates can and often are decided by reply speeches. Um, that's about it on this really. Just wanted to check that everyone is with me so far. Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, the last thing we're going to talk through is uh, motion types. I'm just going to make sure that, okay, the slides are overwhelming, so do not read them, but I promise you that we will keep this as concise and as easy as possible for this briefing. So these are the kinds of topics that you will be encountering and the teams will be encountering at WSDC, and these are the wordings of those topics. And we're just going to walk through what the expectations are and what teams can and can't do in these topics 
so that you have a sense when you're judging whether something is legitimate when a team says it's legitimate um, and whether something is not. So the simplest, easiest to digest is policy topics. More often than not, they're phrased as this house would do something. This house would ban smoking, this house would ban alcohol, very, very common formulation of debates. Because these are policy topics, the debate is not just about in abstract, do we think it's a good idea that people can drink alcohol? The debate is about the specific policy that proposition wants to implement. And you can have big differences based on different policies. So a prop team might say, by the end of this year, we will shut down all liquor stores, we will shut down the liquor industry, um, and alcohol is no longer legal, we will punish everybody that drinks, we will punish everybody that sells, we will punish you know, everyone with fines and prison. You could have another prop team that says, the way to do this is that we would give it two or three years time so that all the industries can sort of phase out, We'll train the employees to enter different industries. In this time, we will punish people who illegally make alcohol, but we will send people to rehab who illegally drink alcohol. That's an entirely different way to implement the same policy on banning alcohol or banning smoking. So the debate then becomes, what is proposition's way of implementing this policy? And is that way of implementing the policy as well as the overall policy, good or bad? So prop teams have the right to implement the policy. There is the idea of fiat. Fiat means the policy is implementable in its most basic form. That is, you cannot question whether it will pass in parliament that smoking should be banned. On the other hand, opposition as well has the same amount of resources and political will to do some sort of counter policy on their side. So op teams can say, we won't ban alcohol, but we will use that same amount of money to train police to be able to police neighborhoods where there is high alcoholism. They can say we can use this money in regulatory bodies to check the quality of alcohol and the quantity of alcohol content in each bottle. Uh, we can use this money to create licenses for alcohol stores and we can do that. And then opposition proposition are clashing with each other and it's a clash between those two models. So prop can't assume that op is just going to have no restrictions on consumption of smoking or alcohol whatsoever. And op can't assume that proposition is going to implement this policy in the worst possible way. So therefore a policy debate, prop can have model, op can have model. If both teams have model, the debate is between the two models. If one team has model, the debate is between the model and whatever the other team says the world is. Neither team compulsorily has to have a model, but they have a right to have a model. And it, in many, many cases, a model can strategically help them in the debate. Does that make sense to everyone? Yes. Yes. Perfect. Um, some motions, even though they're not phrased as this house would, will still require models because there are multiple ways of doing a thing and the debate needs to be clear which way we mean. So if we said this house believes that the US should sanction Saudi Arabia, there are many, many ways to sanction them. You can put diplomatic sanctions, you can put economic sanctions, you can put armed sanctions, you can do one after the other based on how Saudi Arabia reacts, you can do just two. All of these are possible ways to sanction Saudi Arabia. It is not clear to us which one we're going to run with unless pro proposition clarifies that. So if proposition does clarify that, then the debate then becomes what is proposition sanction type and then opposition responds to that. If proposition doesn't clarify that, obviously opposition can say they haven't clarified this. This is the assumption we're making for these two reasons and that's the debate we're going to have. So broadly, those are also motion types where props have a right to a model. They have to show that this is the likely way in which the US will implement this sanction. And ops um, as well can obviously challenge the org arguments, they can challenge the model as well. So this is broadly model debates. This house would do something, this house believes that someone should do something. Um, the second type is motions that start, this house believes that, and I know I have covered some of it in the earlier slide, but trust me, part of debating is that it is technical and confusing sometimes, but it's all really, it depends kind of answers. So I'm going to try and quickly clear that up. The first type of this house believes that motions aren't 
really actions. They're just evaluations. So what do we mean? This house believes that labor unions are becoming obsolete. That is a debate where you are evaluating. Are they becoming obsolete? Are they not? That's not the same as this house would ban labor unions. The latter is a policy. The former is an evaluation. This house believes that benevolent dictatorships are better than weak democracies. Is the prop saying this house would invade all countries that are weak democracies and set up benevolent dictatorships in them? No, they're not. But are they evaluating which is a better system of governance? Yes, they are. This house believes that there is too much money in sports. Are we actually doing something in that topic? No, we're not. But is that a debate that is evaluating whether the commercialization of sport is harmful? Yes, it is. So these are all examples of value judgment debates. There is no action being performed, but there is a value judgment. So what do props and ops have a right to do in this? Prop teams can describe what it means to become obsolete. Prop teams can describe what a benevolent dictatorship looks like, what a weak democracy looks like. Prop teams can describe what too much money in sports means and what a world looks like if we didn't have that level of money in sports. What can op teams do? Op teams can also have their descriptions of the same terms and explain why their descriptions are the more likely descriptions or the more reasonable descriptions. They can choose to accept props descriptions and have a debate on the rest of the arguments. What they can't do is they can't be like prop didn't have an explanation for how they would turn every democracy into a dictatorship. That's a bit unreasonable, not what the debate is about and not a burden that can be pushed on prop. That's broadly it on these sorts of debates. Does that make sense in terms of why they're different to policy debates? I will assume that that is a yes. Um, okay, so the next one is... Yes, yes, it's very clear, thank you. Sorry, the next one is, this has beliefs that X should do Y. So we already talked about the US-Saudi example on the earlier slide, but here you've got parents should adopt children rather than have their own biological children. That um, LGBTQ movements should um, abandon the idea that you are born this way. So there are many, many debates where a particular actor you are saying should commit a particular action. Now, not all of them may require model-esque model situations. Some of them might, but what do we know? In those sorts of debates, the word should implies that there is some sort of moral obligation on the actor to do that thing. So proposition teams have to set up why that moral obligation exists. Or teams can go one of two ways. In some cases, they may say, we don't have a moral obligation to do this. In some cases, they may say, we have a moral obligation to do the opposite of this. Those are two different ways to oppose the topic. You can do either one, depending on the topic. So if I said companies should not ask for your undergraduate degree, you don't have to say all companies should ask for your undergraduate degree. You can say there are cases where companies have good reasons why they're asking for an undergraduate degree. So there is no obligation on them not to ask. Whereas if I said the US should sanction Saudi, you can't be like the US can sanction Saudi if they want to. You ideally have to pick the way that goes. We actually think it is bad for the US to sanction Saudi. They have the obligation not to sanction Saudi Arabia. So does that make sense overall? That's the second type of this house believes that topic. The last thing, uh, I yeah. have a question. Uh, I'll get to that question in just one second. The last thing to say is if the motion says this house believes that X is better than Y, that X should do Y rather than Z, that means the motion is forcing op teams to defend Y or Z. So if I say, this house believes that blue is better than red. Op teams have to say, no, 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 red is better than blue. If I say this house believes that Alice should judge at WSTC and not at Euros, op teams should say, no, no, Alice should judge at Euros and not at WSTC. You don't get to pick your own options if the motion has stated the options. Okay, so um, I have a question on chat that says, yes, that is great. Uh, but apart from that, we had another question. Can we hear that out? Uh, yes, please. Uh, I, I wanted to ask that how do you, like, when it comes about moral imperative or an actor in, in a debate or something, how do you engage different moral principles? So, for instance, one side may uh, put forward a very altruistic principle that, you know, there exists some sort of a uh, moral, abstract moral responsibility to do this, but 
the other side might uh, pick out uh, pick up a very utilitarian uh, yeah approach to it so how do you gauge these yeah. two moral principles because uh, at times it becomes subjective that morality is itself is a subjective thing so yeah so that's a really it? that's a really good question and i think to some extent you answered yourself which is which speaks to the subjective nature of this so a couple of things one is we just have to listen out to what the teams are saying so sometimes teams will say we have a moral responsibility to do this regardless of what the consequences of that are so as an example you know uh, this is all coming off of a world universities video that i've watched so really that's that's where my knowledge is from i can i can share some links but basically they could go if i steal money from alice it doesn't matter whether alice when i give the when i return the money to her as restitution will spend that on alcohol or will spend that on books that's not your problem the consequence of how she uses that money is not that not your problem the fact is that you have to give her money back and that is a principle of reciprocity here are the two reasons why we should uphold that principle regardless of how the other person uses the money and as, and if they do this that means opposition team has a responsibility to respond for why alice is using the money or the way she is using the money why is that still important and still something that we should consider in making our decision so that response has to come from op similarly prop teams in most criminal justice debates will say x is a crime based on the intent and the impact it is not a crime based on if we make this a crime will other people in society have backlash so that should not be in consideration and this should be a crime independent of that so if they say that and give you reasonably good analogies and explanations and reasons for why something should be considered a crime whether or not in the short term there's backlash the op team then has a responsibility to say even if it meets that for a, that criteria for a crime why should other aspects or consequences factor in in how you decide the debate that is one where the teams themselves do a good job of explaining it the second is the teams don't do a good job of explaining it you will have to to some extent extrapolate prop has set up this principle this is the basis on which their principle operates if op through implicit or explicit rebuttal has been able to contravene that basis then op wins that principle even if they don't explicitly say this is our principle that's the best unfortunately the best i can do for you on this really complex question but hopefully that gives you a frame or way to think about this can i ask a follow up question uh yes uh, so what if like uh, the debate like is stripped to its core like uh, what if the two teams start doing an analysis of as to why uh, you know cartesian ethics or tail ontology is a better principle than utilitarianism so would you expect that to happen I mean, in a good match if the two teams it can happen in any debate it can happen in excellent and highly experienced teams of it can happen in newer team rooms it can happen in a high quality debate it can happen in an average debate if the teams have themselves sort of given up on this initial moral consideration that they were setting up and are having this debate on more consequential grounds then that is that is just what evaluates the debate not to forget moral obligations aren't just quote and quote deontological they can also be because of consequences so even if there is a reason for us to intervene in a country if we know that loads of people will die as a result of this intervention that might still be a reason for us not to do it even if that means people are suffering as a result of not doing it so those are still reasons for why a moral obligation might change so the important thing to remember is how the teams argue it fundamentally will decide where the debate goes uh, in terms of win loss perfect thank you that was very helpful um perfect so i will let alice who is i think also on another video explaining this take over um this house supports opposes regrets and this house prefers a world okay let's go uh so first of all let's go to the motions uh with this house regrets so on that specific kind of motion you are regretting something so that means that you uh, that proposition needs to prove that a world where that something didn't exist would be a better world 
So this is necessarily a motion uh, that brings a retrospective to the debate. And the opposition uh, needs to prove that the work with that thing specifically uh, that we are regretting, uh, if this thing keep, uh, keeps existing in the world is better. Uh, this is very important uh, because uh, teams, uh, uh, te teams might try to, to do arguments uh, in the debate that are not specifically uh, related to that. So for example, we if, if we take it, if we take the motion, uh, this house regrets affirmative action uh, in university. That is the example that uh, we have here. Uh, what property is trying to do in the debate is to prove that the word without the existence at all in the history of affirmative action uh, would be better. And opposition uh, is trying to do the contrary. So teams uh, might try to argue things that aren't specifically related to that uh, to, to related to that in the debate. Uh, so it's very important that teams pay attention that their arguments uh, are connecting to the existence of that thing, because there are things that exist in the world that might uh, not change in any scenarios and would keep existing, uh, even if uh, even if, if, if even if uh, the thing that we are debating uh, didn't exist at all. So this is very important when you are judging because uh, this is how you kind of measure the scale of the impact that teams are claiming. So, for example, if an opposition team uh, bring an argument uh, saying that, oh, uh, affirmative action policies are bad because the students uh, suffer discrimination. It is likely uh, that students will kind of suffer discrimination uh, in both scenarios. So what uh, is opposition stance is not like uh, the stance on all discrimination, but specifically only the kind of discrimination that was uh, potentialized by that specific policy. So although we are discussing different words, we need to be uh, very clear how the impact that teams are claiming uh, is connected to the things that we are debating and specifically uh, not only to the existence of that, uh, but to the degree of impact that the specific thing has in the debate. Another thing that is important to mention here is that uh, even though we are uh, discussing if the world would be better, uh, if we are assuming that this thing uh, keeps existing, things can also claim uh, impact on the future. Because even if a policy uh, was implemented in the past, uh, it might have impact on the future. So they are uh, 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 they are right to claim a world uh, being worse or better uh, because that thing existed in the past. Even even if that's not the status quo. So this house regrets motions are basically motions that are looking both ahead and are also looking uh, before uh, to kind of compare uh, both words. So uh, I think those are the main points uh, on that specific kind of motions. And uh, it's very useful to think about the differences uh, that this has uh, with this house opposes and this house support, supports motions. Because although those motions are evaluating if a thing, uh, a policy, an idea, a concept, a narrative uh, is good, it is not necessarily uh, looking uh, to the history of it. So if we are uh, in, in a motion that says this house opposes affirmative action uh, in universities, uh, teams do not need to, to, uh, to take on the burden uh, that this would not have existed uh, at all. So a uh, pro uh, proposition team can can say it does have uh, good impacts in the past, but on the status quo, it doesn't have uh, good impact anymore because of X, Y, Z reasons. So that's why we are opposing that policy, regardless of that uh, already having positive or negative uh, outcomes. So this is a debate uh, that is set uh, profoundly in the status quo. But uh, in the same way that this house regrets motions uh, can claim impacts in the future this uh this house supports and this house uh, and and this house opposed this can also claim impact in the future because uh, if you are supporting a, a, a policy in the status quo or the continuation of a policy or the continuation of a narrative of an idea and things like that it is likely that this will have uh, impacts on how the world will develop so uh, both proposition and opposition can also argue for a future war here uh okay so uh, does anyone have any questions? So let's move on.
Varshini, can you hear me? Oh. Sorry, my laptop took a second to quote. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Okay, uh, so now let's go to this house prefers motions. Uh, so uh, there's uh, some kinds of this house prefer motions here. Uh, so uh, the first kind would be this house prefer uh, something over another thing. Uh, so uh, the example that we have here is this house uh, prefers social media uh, sites based on some subscription model over those based on an advertisement model. So this is uh, specifically comparing uh, just the two examples. So uh, what teams need to do in the debate uh, is uh, defend why one is superior uh, than the other. And this is uh, regard regardless of that uh, being the status quo of uh, one of them uh, being dominant or being uh, or something like that is you seems that are simply arguing why one is better than the other. Uh, so uh, uh, proposition teams uh, necessarily need to defend one, and opposition teams uh, necessarily need to uh, to to defend the other. And it is very important here uh, for you as a judge to pay att attention. Uh, specifically, if, uh, you should pay attention on that in every debate. But uh, here, you should specifically uh, pay attention on the weighting. So teams uh, might be uh, here claiming a lot of impacts from both sides so uh, you need to be very careful uh, to receive uh, what would be uh, the specific benefits of one over the other and what are the exclusive benefits that one over the other uh, are trying are trying to 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 pay a to pay, to, to, to bring in the debate this is very different from this house prefers uh, X. Uh, and in this example, this would be this house uh, prefers social media uh, sites based on a subscription model, uh, because on that specific uh, kind of motion, uh, the opposition doesn't have uh, necessarily uh, another thing that is their stance. So the stance of opposition here uh, is basically uh, the uh, is basically the status quo. So uh, so while proposition is arguing for the specific things uh, that are being defined in the debate opposition basically have the option of uh, uh, uh basically have the option of what is happening uh in in, in the uh, uh, what is happening in the status quo and what it is likely uh to happen in the status quo so for example uh opposition could not argue for abolishing so social media uh, uh websites and other comparatives that do not exist uh however the opposition can still claim uh that the current situation it's changing, so uh, taking a sense of this is the status quo, but it's likely that a status quo uh, will develop in that way uh, that although do not exist is preferable to that and we will be kind of interrupting uh, uh, that sort of thing if we prefer the other. Uh, but uh, here uh, what happens is that uh, opposition cannot uh, kind of uh, pick one specific thing to defend. They need to prove the likelihood of that being what they are defending in the status quo. Uh, and going to the third type of motion, uh, this would be this house prefers a world where social media sites ran on subscription based models. Uh, so the fact that we are adding the word uh, the word award here uh, changes a lot of the context because uh, we are basically debating uh, if the word uh, without the existence of X or with the existence of that thing uh, predominantly would have been a better word. So this is necessarily a debate uh, that also considers the retrospective because we are discussing uh, if uh, we are discussing if the word would have developed in a better way uh, or not uh, in, in a better way of not, or, or not uh, without the existence of that. Uh, as in the other kind, uh, opposition has the status quo, uh, that is, uh, the word being developed the way that the word was developed uh, historically in the status quo is a better word uh, than uh, the word that uh, proposition uh, is arguing for uh, and things like that. 
So uh, what is uh, interesting here is, for example, that if we are considering uh, that the world will have developed in that way, that excludes uh, some lines that opposition uh, could run. So for example, uh, opposition could not run things like uh, there will be a backlash if we change uh, the subscription model, uh, because we are not debating about implanting that policy in the status quo. We are debating uh, as if this policy were already implemented uh, historically. So there's like uh, no backlash because uh, this is how the world would have been and not uh, what we are changing specifically on that work. Cool. Uh, thank you so much. And that's basically the different types. Oh, wait, no, I was wrong. I was wrong. There is finally. Uh, another this, one, right? Yeah, this just <laughs> one. Finally, this house has someone motions like this house as India, this house as a sports person, this house as a parent. Uh, in those cases, you have to exprop has to explicitly link all their arguments to why it is in the interest of that actor, not just why this might be good for the world or why this might be the obligation of the actor. It's why it is in the interest of that actor. Similarly, op also needs to rebut them on the basis that it is not in the interest of that actor. That is different from this house believes that where sometimes you can say this may not be in the interest of parents to do, but they still have an obligation to do this. So that's just broadly the difference. I know we have said a lot at this point. Do we have any questions on motion types and burdens that teams have when these motion types appear? All right. Perfect. Um, that actually takes us to the end of, wait, this chat message yeah um, and I think oh, yes, uh, that's that's you that's you that's fine um, <laughs> okay, perfect so that actually brings us to the end of this section um of the presentation uh if i'm not wrong and i'm indeed not wrong so we're just going to go into judging rules guidelines and process which is sort of the second hour i actually have um an imaginary debate that i had in my own mind that i've sort of written out uh in one of these slides but because a number of you wanted to practice note taking we can just watch the first two speeches of a round that i can uh, sort of broadcast so we'll do that instead as an activity however i just want to quickly go over the process first um can you guys give me a thumbs up or a quick indication that we're good to move into this bit of the of the presentation yeah we're good to move thank you perfect okay so um First thing is, we're just going to go over some quick characteristics of a model judge, um, which is the list that we've got here. I'm not going to take too much time because most of us are reasonably aware of this. First is you have to act as the average reasonable person, like no particularly niche knowledge that just you have because you are a high school teacher that knows everything about the pay models of teachers rather than a general person who has some general idea of how to say teachers are paid. Second is impartial. So please make sure to declare your conflict uh, or if you feel like you can't judge a nation or team fairly, so let us know. Um, third is unbiased. So please don't walk in thinking this is how a prop team should set up this policy. These are the four arguments that they should be running. Be open to being convinced by the arguments that teams are running. Um, four is observant and diligent. And this is super, super important, especially in the online world where it's hard for us to tell um, if you know some of us aren't paying 100% attention, but we are here in service of the kids. So please be sure to pay attention, take good notes, track arguments, responses, and points of information. Um, general, general knowledge possessed to the extent that the average listener does, so some current affairs and basic facts. Um, is an expert on WSDC rules. We've discussed some of them already. So hopefully you are well on your way to becoming an expert on the WSDC rules. And of course, finally, accountable and constructive. So you can justify decisions that you make with explanations based on the debate. And you are very constructive in that you give good feedback to teams uh, that they can take back and use in an educational context. Um, Alice, I know you've got to head off, so I'm going to let you take this slide about um, not being Sally, Wally, Billy, and Millie. 
Okay, cool. And I think just a, a, a general comment uh, before we go through that slide. Uh, judging is a very active process. Uh, so uh, I think a lot of us don't think that we are being specifically biased or things like that uh, on purpose. Uh, so it is very important for you uh, when you are taking notes, when you are in a debate to always keep track of yourself. So for example, if a team uh, said an argument that you thought uh, was a good argument, you you need to always pay it or, or uh, a thing that you might agree or your personal beliefs or things like that. This is always a good moment to ask yourself, uh, am I just liking that? Am I just uh, likely to run that or the team uh, actually prove that thing? Uh, so so don't uh, like just hear it, actively practice uh, when you are listening uh, to the debates to keep track of yourself. Okay, so now on to these slides. So one, uh, let's uh, talk about uh, uh, things that you should not do and missteps to avoid uh, in evaluation and oral adjudication. So the first of them would be uh, using very specific knowledge on a certain topic. So for example, uh, uh, if you are a, a specialist on uh, international policy or uh, in Indian politics or anything like that, and uh, specifically rebuttal wasn't brought in the debate, but you know how to rebut that thing, it is very important uh, for you uh, not to interfere yourself as a judge. Uh, if you, uh, and, and not, not to, to interfere yourself as a judge uh, because that would mean that you will be benefiting another team uh, not because of thing that the other team did but about uh, uh, but because of a specific thing that you know so uh, if you if you are very specialist and you know that uh, this thing could be rebuted in that way uh, or something like that you can always give this as a tip for uh, teams in personal feedback or for their coaches or things like that for future note but those uh, don't like this affect the result of the debate uh, because it would be unfair. You are the judge, you are not debating for the other team. Uh, so it is uh, the responsibility of the other team to point out those things. Okay, uh, I, I think I just uh, might have a clarification on that. Uh, that is, uh, we all know that we are uh, judging debates as an average intelligent voter. So uh, it, if, it, if, if it is a thing uh, that is uh, clearly uh, wrong or an average intelligent voter would know that is a mistake, uh, you probably uh, can uh, interfere on in that, but only uh, when it's not very extremely, uh, extremely specific knowledge. So for example, uh, that would be uh, if someone said that uh, Donald Trump is the president of the United States in the status quo, uh, that would be not a specific knowledge uh, for you as a judge uh, to, to know that this, uh, uh, this is a wrong argument, okay? Uh, so two, uh, accessing the content in the debate based on the argument that teams could have made. Uh, so uh, when we look at motions, uh, it is uh, it, it is almost impossible for us uh, not to think uh, what the debate uh, is likely to look like and things like that. But please do remember uh, that uh, teams still have to make that argument. So uh, if you think that the best uh, proposition stance would be an economic case, for example, and proposition didn't go on that specific route, you should not penalize uh, proposition based on what they could have done. Uh, again, you can always uh, just give them a tip that uh, you think that this could be an interesting line and things like that. But the fact that they did not do something that you would personally do or that you personally th think it's good doesn't mean uh, that they should be penalized by that. Uh, so please, uh, even if you have strong opinions on the motion, doesn't don't, don't let this interfere uh, how you are being the uh, how you are being in the debate. The third would be uh, accessing content based on reputation the judge is able to think against an argument. Uh, so uh, this is very, very, uh, very similar for you using specific knowledge, uh, but even when it's not that specific, you might think yourself that this uh, is a point uh, that is weak because you would respond on that way. Uh, but if the other team is not making that specific uh, rebuttal, uh, you should not uh, do that yourself because that would be, again, you giving credit to another thing on a thing that you might have done. And I would even go a little further here. Uh, that is, uh, 
even if you think that one argument is weak and this argument was rebutted at, in the debate, you still need to pay attention to the effectiveness, uh, effectiveness of that rebuttal. So is this rebuttal that came in the debate uh, uh, really strong uh, enough to take the argument or you are just uh, automatically uh, evaluating this rebuttal as effective just because you think that this could be rebutted? So even if you have individual opinions, uh, please pay attention uh, if uh, the teams are actually doing that. I think the same would go for uh, ass assessing the debate uh, based on arguments that you think uh, might be good for the debate. Uh, if you think the economic case uh, is very good and proposition brings an economic case, you still need to pay attention uh, if they are proving that economic case uh, effectively, if their economic case is really good or if you are uh, kind of uh, completing. And that brings us to the last point that is filling analytical gaps or considering rebuttal that a team has improved themselves. Uh, so uh, you should really pay uh, attention uh, even when you like something specifically that is coming up in the debate that you are not yourself completing the analysis uh, that would ha have been good. Again, I think this is a cool piece of feedback. If you see that happening, uh, you can always lay in, always individually say to teams, oh, I think you could have defeated that argument if you did the analysis on this or that way or possibly any other way. But if the teams are not doing the analysis, uh, you should not uh, do the analysis yourself. Uh, so again, uh, just to wrap up, those are things that you need to constantly uh, be thinking about during the debate when you are hearing any kind of arguments and not things that you just uh, read and forget. This is a constant exercise, even when you are a very experienced judge, uh, to not uh, fall onto the traps. Uh, so I need to uh, head off right now, uh, but I would like to thank you very much. And I am always available if you have uh, any questions or need to discuss any other things. And uh, I'll let I'll, I'll leave you in the good hands of Rashini. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Alice. Perfect. Um, very, very quickly, we'll just go through what is next, which is just remember to be courteous and respectful. These are kids who look up to you. Um, please make sure that Coaches and non-speaking members in the room aren't sort of signaling to debaters what they should be responding to, what's going on um, in, in the debate, and what uh, trying to give them like information from wherever they are. Um, please make sure that you're available for feedback and just like we said, pay attention during talks. Okay, so the judging process. I'll give you all a moment to process this process. End-to-end, uh, -end, it is a six step process, so to speak, that should not take more than one hour. One hour in of itself is generous. So it is starting at arriving at preliminary verdicts. Second is you engage in federal. We'll go through each of these steps. Third is fill ballots in independently. Fourth is support the chair or if you are the chair, prepare the OA. Fifth is the chair or whoever the person is that's meant to deliver the OA will deliver the OA. So an OA is an oral adjudication or reason for decision. And finally, all judges will give individual feedback to the team. So on top of each of these little green bits, we've explained whether you do that by yourself or together, but I'm just pausing for a moment for everyone to read through that six step process. Um, and then once someone just hits uh, yes, we can move on in the chat or gives me a thumbs up. I will just move to the next slide. Each slide goes through what each of these steps mean and what how, how we can implement that. Uh, just so I can ask, what is the difference for trainee judges uh, in regards to this? Perfect. So uh, the answer to that question is trainee judges will do everything in this process except for making a final decision. That is trainee judges do not get to submit a ballot. They will arrive at preliminary verdicts. They'll engage in conferral. They will not make the final decisions. They will not fill ballots independently. They can help in the OA preparation. They can um, also give individual feedback to teams based on teams coming to them for feedback. What they definitely can't do is submit a ballot. Does that make sense? 
Uh, yes. Also, in re uh, when it comes to giving feedback, personal feedback, I'm guessing that that actually is it um up like after the OA, still with the teams there, or is it like yes. teams coming so, to you and asking? Let me just walk through this process logistically. So what happens is there is every um, overall division will have Zoom breakout rooms for prep and Zoom break breakout rooms for the debate. So the debate will happen in the room that prop teams prep in. The room that op teams prep in will therefore be empty. Round ends, the three judges plus training, uh, one training, not more in a room, will move to the opposition breakout room, take a couple of minutes, arrive at preliminary verdicts. After that, the chair will facilitate a discussion between the judges to have to confer and share perspectives on the debate and clarify any questions. After that, the judges will make their final decisions and let the chair know. All of them will fill in their ballots independently. All this is happening in the off breakout room. Then they will quickly help the chair prepare the OA should the chair need any confirmations from them after taking notes during the discussion. Then all the judges will go back to the debate room, which used to be the prop prep room. OA is delivered in the prop prep room. After this, teams split off. Prop will stay in the prop prep room. Op goes back to the op prep room. Judges split off and give feedback to teams. Exchange and give feedback to the other teams. Does that all make sense? Uh, yes. To the questions on who is a trainee extra. At the start, all allocations are decided by judge scores that you put into the judge um, test, either the IA test or the, or the institutional judge test that you have to fill in. After that point, however, every round, the weightage of your judge test keeps reducing relative to the weightage of the feedback that teams give you and your chair in the room gives you if you are a trainee judge. The last thing to say is there will be cases where we are training judges not because it's some form of punishment. It is never a punishment. At best, it is because we have a surplus of judges and want to give more judges breaking ability. For that, we need more information. At worst, it's a learning opportunity. So just wanted to make it clear that being a trainee or being a panelist or being a chair doesn't necessarily indicate your strength. May just indicate things like we want to test some people giving OAs. We have a surplus of judges, but want to make sure that people are judging and giving us feedback that we can give them feedback on. Um, all makes sense so far in terms of the combination of things we're making decisions based on. Hopefully that's a yes. Um, okay, so we're going to watch two speeches after this upcoming slide. Okay. So the first is how do we arrive at preliminary verdicts? Four step process. First is track the debate closely through good notes, identify the issues as they emerge in the debate. So what is an issue? Let's say that you are making a decision. So let's say I'm making the decision of what is my favorite food? Is it cake or is it butter naans, because that's the thing in India. And if you haven't tried it, you have to get, get here and try butter naans. So is it cake or is it this other beautiful butter bread that I'm talking about? To make that decision, I need to ask myself sub questions. So I need to go, I need to evaluate this overall question of what is my favorite food by evaluating which one has better taste, which one has better texture, and which one is more filling. These are the three questions I'm going to ask myself. Now, under taste, what all information do I have about the cake and about the butter? Under um, whether it's filling or not, what information do I have? And under texture, what information do I have? Then I will compare the information about the cake, the information about the butter naan. And at the end of that, I will declare the cake is tastier and therefore it is my favorite. The butter naan has better texture and therefore in that question, I like the butter naan better. Finally, I'll be like, a cake is more filling, so I like a cake better. 
now the situation is i have two questions where the cake is better and one question where the butter naan is better now these three sub questions that i asked to decide the overall question is called an issue now in a debate if i say this house would ban smoking you might ask yourself sub questions how should i decide based on this debate that happened whether or not smoking should be banned the teams will have some arguments that indicate this to you so the teams might say something as something like um you know what uh people should have the right to do whatever they want to their body the other team might be like no no people shouldn't have this right if they are hurting their body in the future because then they can do less of what they want to do so that's a question of choice right so that's an issue of choice and to someone's question yes that is a clash point in the debate about choice then you might ask yourself a second sub question on whether smokers as families are better or worse in a world with and without smoke uh, where smoking is banned and not banned so that's how you decide issues you can't decide issues based on what you want you can't be like i know in any smoking debate issues are choice and health families black market and um, economy you can't just make that decision when you go into the debate maybe the teams won't make an argument about the economy maybe the teams won't make the argument about choice so it depends what the teams are giving you information on so if i have to go back to my cake and naan example um you might have a situation where you haven't watched anything to tell you about a particular aspect about the cake in which case you don't know about that aspect of the cake that's not in your decision making process and that's how to treat this that's what issues are now if there are two issues team a has won one issue team b has won team a doesn't automatically win right team a only wins if their two issues are more important put together than team b's one issue now if the situation is team b's issue that they have won is much more important and they could win the debate just winning that one issue how do you know if the issue is important more important team b will have themselves given you reasons three reasons why winning this issue means we win the debate regardless of other issues and they will have compared so those are ways to evaluate who won what's most important and therefore who won who won the issues what's most important and therefore who won the debate and this is a process you need to constantly be doing at the end of every speech you need to have a sense of who do i think is ahead based on the material that has come out in their speech the most important thing to remember is that the winner of a debate is evaluated by the material that has come out in the debate rather than by the scores the scores are a mathematical expression of who won who won is not an expression of the scores does that make sense even though i said that confusingly what i mean is first decide who wins then match speaker scores to who wins do not decide what the speaker scores are and then go because my totals are coming up to this and this person x wins the reason i say that is because otherwise you will have recency bias i have this habit where every speech i listen to i'm like oh but this speech was responsive to that speech the speech responded to the speech before it and by that logic you will just end up in a situation where you've forgotten what first prop has said and you remember what third op has said and that is that so do not fall into that trap make sure to evaluate based on all the content in the round from all the speakers and then make your preliminary verdict does that all make sense to everybody and are we ready to practice this on the first two speeches of a debate we watch let me just stop my screen share for a second there so that in case this is a question uh, anyone's got questions that i can see oh yes sorry um i do have a question um is an issue the same as what's commonly called a clash point that's correct so key questions clash points issues are all the same okay thank you uh sorry for using multiple words to refer to the same thing but yes um all right perfect um let me just share my screen once again how do i okay copy perfect so we're just going to watch the first prop and first op speeches okay request to everybody is please make sure to track the speeches which means take notes in terms of how do you take good notes 
Um, Eric, you can walk through this if you'd like, but should I just go over some very quick tips that I've got? Uh, you can go ahead, yeah. Sure. Okay, something that I do is, I take a sheet and keep it vertically. Obviously you might be doing this on a laptop. If you're doing it on a laptop, just draw a table with two columns, left-hand side column for prop, right-hand side column for off. If you're using a sheet, fold the sheet along the center, left-hand side for prop, right-hand side for off. Some of you may not be very comfortable with doing that and that's fine. And you can just take one speaker per sheet or whatever, but I just do this so that I can see the two speakers and their interactions at the same time. Second is please, Use as much shorthand as you are comfortable with. Use abbreviations, use symbols like up arrow for increases, down arrow for decreases, X for doesn't happen, tick for happens, as much shorthand as you want. And in some cases, you can even pre-write the segments that you're going to slot a speaker's speech into. Now, the benefit of doing that is I go into a debate writing down model, first argument, second argument, rebuttal, first argument, second argument. However, speakers may not follow that structure, in which case you will have to do the extra work of making that segregation yourself when they haven't done. So that is the benefit and harm of that. Um, I do it because it just helps me process more easily, but remember not to be wedded to that structure. So those are just a couple of things I had to say. Um, Eric, if you had extra things to say there that I missed out. Uh, another thing that you might find useful, which I personally do, is just making initial notes as the speakers are articulating certain things on whether or not you believe this has been explained enough. So for instance, something that I do is I prepare this with a question mark. This does not factor into the scoring. This is just for you as a judge to have a way to recall what are certain parts of the speeches that you perhaps had an issue with. So you can do that in real time because it also would help you with feedback, for example, where you are a, where you have to articulate some sort of constructive criticism and be like, this first point, I would have appreciated maybe greater clarity on this second mechanism. I was not really sure what you're getting at. So just a symbol or a way for you to recall what are some important things in the speech that you maybe find issue with or that you think are also exceptional. Maybe you want to also indicate that as the speech is happening in real time. Yeah. Um, perfect. So we'll pause after first prop just to check that everyone is with us and pause after first off. Motion is this house regrets the rise of call out culture. This house regrets the rise of call out culture. Um, is there anything you want us to clarify about the motion before we start? Now, obviously, reminder, the word regrets exist in the debate. So Prop teams will have to say, you know, if we could go back in time and, and not have call out culture, what will we have instead seen and what will we have had and preferred? And, you know, op teams can either choose to challenge that by saying that's not what will have existed. Here's another shitty thing that will have existed. Or they could say, yes, we agree with you that what you say will have existed, but what you say is pretty bad. So those are both options that op teams can take. Okay, are we ready to play this video? Perfect, um, we're getting started. Things to keep in mind at the end of this, we'll have a quick discussion on how to articulate who is ahead and how to evaluate who is ahead. So that should be what you're keeping in mind while tracking these two speeches. Uh, I can't hear the speaker. I don't know if it's a problem for anyone else. Yeah. Uh, the sound isn't there. Sorry, Vashni. Sorry, I... Hang on a sec. New share, share sound. That's what happened. That's what happened. Yeah. Okay, let me try again. In the war against injustice, it can be all too tempting to demoralize the enemy with cannons of vengeance and bullets of hatred. But this must be fought, this war must be fought with kindness and understanding. Therefore, the criteria in which this debate must be adjudicated on is whether we can prove how call-up culture in its way has manifested is counterproductive and toxic, 
something we should clearly regret. Two arguments in my speech. The first is why call-out culture is principally unjust, and the second, why call-out culture is counterproductive in a general sense. But before that, what do we support on proposition? We support any and every action to combat words and deed without the presence of rage and hatred without the need to strip people of their dignity in a public setting and inflame issues even more. Therefore, we will push for call-in culture. As the name suggests, we will have private discussions and non-targeted messaging that promotes cohesion instead of the misgivings of people. This materializes by pushing more literature on contentious issues like mental health, like racial disparities, to make it clear in the public consciousness that certain things are categorically harmful. Moreover, since this is a regret motion, we would prioritize campaigns, better education, social media platforms, the efficacy of all of this severely diluted by this call-out culture that opposition must defend. This thus we will also prove how in retrospect individuals would have been much more receptive to these things without all of this call-out culture existing in the first place. The first argument, why call-out culture is principally unjust. It is important to recognize that no one in this world is born racist, sexist, or discriminatory. For those that grew up and deployed a bunch of offensive language, it's likely they grew up in a world of ignorance, a world of indoctrination, and negative experiences. Three examples. The first is, for negative experiences, someone who grows up sexist may have had bad experiences with women, associating these issues on a micro sense with the macro sense of women in general. The second example is bullies are less likely to come, are more likely, sorry, to come from broken homes and lack of constructive parental supervision. Thus, they thrive on the fact that they need security and satisfaction that would be sadly missing within their contracts of their homes and their schools. No, thank you. Thirdly, the richer members of society would be ignorant of the fact of acute struggles of people in poverty, the struggles that they would not have to associate with on a day-to-day -day basis, and thus are more likely to deprioritize these issues. What do these three examples illustrate? In all these instances, when someone commits an offense, there is always a story behind it, a story where perpet perpetrators are victims, and when society itself has failed them, from the start. The impact of all of this is that call-out culture exclusively ignores the nuances of all the analysis I brought earlier on. Therefore, the offense is viewed with the lens that people that commit these crimes are, or commit these actions are horrible and not someone that we should engage in the very first case. This makes call-out culture, no thank you, a disproportionate response and over punishes people that shouldn't be punished in the first place or predisposed biases that they have no reason to be called out for. The conclusion of this argument is the motives of people's actions are independent of the outcomes of said actions and does not ju justify discriminating against predispositions like the ones highlighted earlier. Before going on the second argument about why call-out culture is counterproductive, sure. Why are motives important? These people aren't being prosecuted. This is about regulating what we think ethical speech is. So at the point of which we've proved already that the is principally, we should not punish them principally on this basis. What is, why is call-out culture counterproductive in terms of outcomes and why the same change in opposition we're trying to prove won't exist in their world? The premise of this argument of why call-out culture is counterproductive is given there are reasons for people to act in politically incorrect ways, the lack of nuance in call-out culture is ineffective in dealing with the problems that are so pervasive in our society today. Note when someone is called out, what are the realistic responses that we see on side proposition? We see two responses. The first is that, that there are a wide range of responses, but the commonality in much of the responses is that it is human nature to be defensive. It is human nature to have our subconscious protect our own specific interests at the cost of other people's interests. We have prioritized what we view as sacred over someone else. So now that call-out culture is done in public, to intentionally aggravate someone else, the defensive instincts within human nature come at an exponential rate, something that opposition has in their world and becomes the default in dealing with, for example, consultations and confrontations in their side of the house. They need to tell us why people would have this defensive instinct that will push them to cross the line even further in certain instances. This means it's highly likely that people who now respond in kind 
a downward spiral of malicious and over displays of aggression. Secondly, although call-out culture is effective in trying to silence people, they don't always change or don't often change the opinions of the very same people that you call malicious, the very same people that are destructive in their world. What is more likely is you're probably going to get accusations level, levied against them, but what happens is they rally together. Racists can now rally together and say that they are the victims of society to the point at which day after day they get abused and uh, abused online or threats on the street. All of them rally together as victims, attacked by a politically correct society that is out, going out of their way to make sure that they don't have a viable chance in society. What is the clear harm of this? The harm of this is that a polarizing effect is created with concentrated bursts of vile attacks being levied against each other. So on the comparative, we see that races get far more entrenched in their ways, the point at which there's a lack of engagement, that lack of constructive engagement coming from their side house. All we want to push for is telling you that you're racist and you're a terrible person, someone that I should never engage with. What we would rather support is coming out in a private setting with the emotion Trans, uh, with the emotion taken away from it and some engaging with constructive matters that will help both sides. How does this specific issue improve in our world? Communicating with people privately as objective as possible means that it's far easier for the message to sink in. That either wrong may be committed, but it's less damaging to your ego if one person goes up to you and tells you that you are, they felt uncomfortable. What do they have to defend in their world? They have to defend the myriad of Twitter wars that go against specific individuals. Individuals that are not likely to change because you're visibly attacking everything they principally stand for online. This looks like, on our side, people are more likely to apologize on specific issues. Because apologizing is far more reachable to the point at which you don't attack them and prima facie attack and hominem attacks as well. Their side needs to tell us why people would ever want to change the point at which they know that they will be attacked, they know they'll be attacked in droves, and they know that they won't be engaged with. That is the realistic comparative that side opposition needs to push up with us. They cannot tell us that people will somehow be silent, the point at which a silent minority can come up and form a group that can actively ta tackle the specific groups of other, the specific opposition that exists against them. It is crucial to not fight fire with fire when you're trying to reach a constructive solution. So proud to propose. Right, just pausing quickly to check if um, we broadly got that and anyone's got any questions. That was good. Um, perfect. Does Maybe I, I think maybe we share our notes at the end of first op. Does that work, Eric? Yes, I think that would be fair. What proposition just spent eight minutes telling you is that when there is a wildfire, we shouldn't react with a more aggressive manner. We should use a cup of water and hope that the flames are going to be doused. We don't think that that's how life works. We think that minorities live perpetually harmed, perpetually disenfranchised, perpetually stripped of their dignity. And what often happens then is that we put the blame on them. We tell them that you reacting angrily is the inherent problem to why you keep getting disempowered. You shouldn't be angry. You shouldn't have feelings. Instead, bottle your feelings, sit down with your perpetrator, and just hope, hope, hope that you can get through to them. We don't think that that's fair. We don't think that that works. But beyond that, we think that call out culture is the one way we can make sure that minorities meaningfully get empowered. Let's talk about what we're going to give you as opposition. The case that we present to you is for is the following. And like essentially the criteria here is when do we think we regret a means of social justice? What I'm going to bring to you my speech is why we think polar culture is a legitimate form of justice, but more of all we think it's more effective in protecting minorities. Because they misrepresent the aims of polar culture here. Polar culture does not exist to change people's opinions. It exists to get them out of the public sphere where they can keep harming the people. It exists to keep them up, right? In the same way that sometimes you can see that you might not change someone who's getting a life sentence, but at the very least they are out of that society and they can't keep harming those people, the two examples of hungry, right? So that's what we're gonna give you. We're gonna give 
bring you further. In the second page is how we can that pull-up culture specifically impacted in terms of social interaction, stretching beyond the specific minority. But before that, some rebuttal. Let's firstly just do some clear up, right? First in terms of pull-up culture, because what they do here is like conveniently pick the worst version of pull-up culture and try and force us to defend that. We don't think that's about what, what pull-up culture looks like. What, we have to concede that to a degree that pull-up culture has a lot of anger and it has a lot of like um, like people who are essentially just angry about their situation. They're not going to defend one thing that they're justified in having that anger. But we have to recognize that it exists on a spectrum. It's everything from reporting someone on Instagram for an offensive post all the way to that anger. We don't think that people automatically just jump to that anger. Important context is, is that it's often proportional to the harm that's been done, right? So people say really bad things, like Milo Annapolis saying that Grace Jones is a gorilla, are things that get very bad reactions. But some guy, like who we don't really know, saying I might not like black people, is not likely to get as widespread, as violent, as much of a reaction. Color culture does not just exist jumping to the end of the spectrum. It, 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 it works specifically in accordance with the harm being done, right? The second thing that they try and tell you, specifically in setup, is that they prefer one-on-one -on -one interactions. They prefer prefer an amicable kind of way to reach a solution, right? We don't think that this is something that usually works specifically because what often happens in that amicable solution is that people still believe that they are in the right. That's what often happened with, with, rape, with rape campaigns, when people are told that you probably shouldn't rape people and that no, they're not asking for it and, and that was essentially amicable pleading to end rape it doesn't work. It has never worked. Rape is still a massive problem, but specifically in light of all those protests, rape continue to rise, right? We think that these are problems that are endemic to perpetrators, and trying to appeal to them amicably doesn't deal with the fact that those problems are endemic to them. Now let's talk about the, the matter that they give you. They tell you firstly that it's, in, that it's not justified because you're attacking someone for their predispositions over which they have no control. Note here that they also choose to defend the best of people who just don't know what they're doing. At no point do they talk about people who actually know that they might just hurt all the black people in America with their words, right? But, but more, like, and moreover, at no point do they tell us why this predisposition is something that's justified, right? Because I think that we punish people for predispositions a lot. We punish people who are psychopathic for killing, even though it's not really your fault. And that's because we judge the, the, the harm of an action on the harm itself instead of just the perpetrator who did it, right? We think that it is just to judge on, on predispositions because they bear as much harm as someone who could have been doing it on purpose. We don't think that that argument stands. But moreover, they try and tell you that it's counterproductive, right? I've already clarified how they misrepresented those aims. I'm going to tell you why it specifically fulfilled those aims later in my matter. But they give you two things here. That one, it leads to a downward spiral of aggression where you can never get any good outcomes. We don't think this is true, right? We have to, like, we have to accept that in some instances that there, that there may be aggression. But you know what often happens? That there's actual room for discourse. It looks like things like Trevor Noah on The Daily Show saying that the Heineken advert where the bottle miraculously passed through black people is something that's racist that we shouldn't accept that leads to discourse in the withdrawal of an advert. Things that can lead to tangible outcomes those outcomes being the removal of offensive things from the public sphere of life, right? We don't think that this downward spiral is something that's inherent to call out culture. But even if it was, we think that it's something that is justified specifically in terms of how minorities choose to interact with people, right? That having having operated from a position of disadvantage for so long, we think that it is justified that they are angry. We think that it is justified that they express their anger. People who have been silenced for as long as civilization has been accepted are, are justified in expressing the kind of anger that they built up. The next thing that they tell you here is that you don't really change the you don't really change anyone, but that they rally themselves together as victims, right? We do think that they do that, but that doesn't mean we start accepting that they're right, right? It looks like people like the KKK rallying themselves together, but at no point did anyone say, oh, that's call out culture's fault, let's stop call out culture, right? We think we often begin to understand them as a group and understand their aims, right? It looks like things like Katie Hopkins putting a target on her head and saying, this is how it feels to be a white conservative woman in the new age, right? And people literally saying, that's the perfect metaphor because the target is fake and you put it there yourself, right? In that we are able to judge these groups even after they rally themselves, we are able to call them out. It doesn't diffuse call out culture in any way. So what you're getting from my rebuttal is that one, it is something that we think is a just metric of justice, but moreover, we think that is something that aside from not leading to the harm that they give you, can actually fulfill its aims. Now let's talk about why we think it is just and specifically like the two particular minorities, these points are intertwined. Before that, yeah. So if the main aim of call-out culture is to ensure people don't say or carry out harmful actions, would you support physical intimidation as an effective method of ensuring this is an occur? No, right? Physical intimidation is something that's done before that. But we think that call-out culture is specifically in terms 
of trying to address the harms that have been perpetrated onto people, but in a way that is proportional to what they are saying. We're not just going to physically intimidate everyone we think is saying the wrong thing, and that is something that is proportional to what is being done, and that harm is endemic to words, can be dealt with in words. So, why do we think that call-out culture is essential to the liberation of minorities? And this is central to the debate, because call-out culture exists to protect minorities in removing harmful things from the public sphere of life, right? But we think that moreover, they are the most important people in this debate, on the basis of historical and current vulnerability, that they're not treated with equal respect to anyone else. This makes them the people we have to evaluate. The side that's going to win this is the side that proves how call-out culture actually affects minorities. Let's talk about how we previously engaged with terms. And here, two important things. So one was often very amicable to perpetrators. It used to be very nice to them, it begged them to change. But moreover, it put the onus on the victims to then change. It's, it's traditions like ironing women's breasts flat so in hopes that they don't get raped, right? A lot of the onus is put on victims to make sure that crimes aren't perpetuated onto them and that harmful sentiments don't affect them. What call culture did was make the problem endemic to the person who is the problem. It's, it's things like men are trash saying that men are actually the problem because men are the people who actually rape women, right? Call culture is essential to that. But the rise of it means that people are a lot more comfortable in saying that out loud. It means that you, the bottlenecking of expression that minorities have had to face for so long is something that becomes less and less normalized because call culture is rising. Call culture is becoming an inherent part of that society, right? What we think that it does is it makes that expression of justice easier for minorities, that they can react in a way that allows them to express what they're feeling and give them that which they had been denied for so long, but we think that more of it is something that can begin to meaningfully protect them by silencing those who harm them. And on that basis, we think that call culture is essential to the sphere of if we look back at the birth so sorry just give me one second um okay we'll just give everyone a couple of minutes to go through your notes um just process what you've heard and then um, start the discussion in a couple of minutes
Um, Eric, we can start whenever you're ready. Uh, okay, sorry. I, I, uh, great. So first things first, I'm just going to share screen with my notes. Uh, this is my personal note taking style, of course, and uh, notes are deeply personalized. So you have to develop your own uh, way of taking notes. Sorry, I can't screen share. Uh, screen share is disabled. Sorry, I, I didn't realize I hadn't given you co-hosting. So let me just make you co-host. Oh, I can't do that in this room, it would seem. So I'll just uh, make you screen share. Okay, you should be able to now. Yes, I can screen share. Uh, Okay, so I personally, when typing online, do one speech per page. So this is how I wrote down the notes. So I make a note of what is the introduction of the speaker. That usually is how they want to frame the round or what they view as important. The round, I think P1 establishes a criteria for when we should regret. To call it culture, they say that it's harmful towards the aims of it and that it leads to a toxic uh, kind of culture. And then they go on to their stance. This is pretty important because here's where they frame their counterfactual, which is the idea of call in culture, where they believe that they're likely to have more cohesion and also do things like push out more educational campaigns onto individuals such that they're able to change their views. Uh, I'm not gonna go through a play by play of the entire speeches, but as you can broadly see, I indent as a way of showing impact or as a way of showing what derives from a previous mechanism when I'm typing online. And there's also conclusions. One thing that I would note is, again, I put a question mark on things that I'm not certain I actually prove it. So towards the conclusion of the proposition principle, they say the importance of that argument is that it, it proves that motives are different from the outcomes of the actions. And therefore, we principally ought not punish individuals for, through call out culture. I think this needs a bit more elaboration. That's why I think there's a question mark page with regards to I'm not totally convinced by this, but I still do note it down. And then similarly for opposition, that's their introduction. Um, what is their stance in this debate? I think they try to broaden the round and say that you know it's not necessarily just about changing individuals' opinions through color culture, but it is rather to prevent societal harm from arising due to that. Um, which is why we want to remove them from the public sphere and call out culture is the mechanism through which we do that by uh, like giving criticisms onto this individual. And then they also try to set up counter what is call out culture or characterize call out culture in a manner that's quite different from what the proposition does with regards to talking about how this exists across the spectrum. It's not necessarily just the angry sort of vitriol that the P1 problematizes, but that it, it can exist across the spectrum, such as uh, reporting posts and why that is also largely to be, uh, to be important for individuals. And then they spend quite a lot of time with reputation. Oh, just another thing also, I do not POI exchanges and then move on to their arguments, right? Their argument is on why this is best for minorities. And they essentially push the idea that in the absence of color culture, we lead to a lot of victim blaming. Okay, with regards to evaluating who I think is ahead after the first exchange, I think there are two questions to evaluate, right? Hang on, Eric, we should probably source questions from folks. Oh, sorry, yes, that is true. I will stop sharing at this stage. If there are any questions or anything which is unclear so far, uh, this is the time to ask. And as well as, I also meant we should source the clash questions from folks as well. Yeah. Um, does anyone want to perhaps share with us what they believe are the important clashes at this point in the debate? Uh, I guess what I generally consider important um, is first, I guess, in terms of whether uh, call-out culture is, nece is necessarily effective. And this is, um, I guess, something that exists mainly on the side of opposition, in a sense, because it's uh, their burden to prove this effectiveness. And it was noted that it would be presented as an argument. Um, also, on a principle on the level of principle which one which side is more just because both sides talk about justice uh, specifically the side of uh, proposition talking about uh, how call out culture is principally unjust and the side of opposition mentioning how um let me just see my that it's a legitimate form of justice so this is another clash point that i personally note um um, actually, I think these are the things that I have noted in terms of clashes. I guess the uh, more clashes are going to appear as the... Yeah, as the debate progresses. So I would agree with that overall, being the clashes that do come up in the round. Um, just to be 
clear? You said effectiveness is proven more by the opposition, or did you mean that prop pushes a burden no, on the opposition? Not necessarily that it is proven more, in the sense that opposition depends more on proving uh, the this, uh, this effectiveness, because like it's the entirety of their position, like um, a, ca a, ca a call out culture is effective, and it is an argument that exists, though it has not been presented yet in fullness. Uh, so that's okay. what I was saying. Ah, got it. Okay, so opposition is contingent upon proving that color culture is effective. Um, I would posit a question here, and I'll hopefully someone else can try to answer this. But how do we then measure the efficacy of color culture? Because I think both both teams set up different metrics of of evaluating when color culture should be viewed as um, effective. So perhaps Hamza, what did you get as the criteria or the metric that proposition sets up of efficacy of color culture? And do you think this is a criteria that is conceded by the opposition or do you think the opposition like pushes against this uh, criteria? Uh, I think the criteria that proposition had set for call out culture was more uh, of reformation or uh, changing people's opinions. So like uh, reforming the society or getting rid of all these beliefs or uh, things that people say that actually translate into uh, tangible actions. So their uh, uh, metric was more of rehabilitation or reformation of the perpetrator. Uh, however, the metric that the opposition set was, uh, you know, preventing uh, societal harm to those minorities that are tangibly being affected by it. So I think as the debate would progress, I think both of the teams would have an imperative for us to prove which uh, uh, metric sh should be the metric for call out culture or like, which is a higher aspiration to, uh, you know, for, for the call out culture, should it be more retributive or should it be more uh, rehabilitative? So I think that would become the part of the debate later on. Yeah, precisely, right? I think proposition says that the important thing that we have to try to do in this round is to provide education and to make individuals aware of the actions that they do, which is quite helpful in society. And their analysis is to say that at the, there is an instinctive human reaction that if you are criticized and attacked, you are likely to become more defensive and therefore less receptive to that information. Opposition says, well, this really does not matter for us. We think what is important is the removal of these individuals from the public sphere such that they're not able to commit or perpetrate further harm. The same way we give individuals life sentences, we don't necessarily care about reforming them. We just want to protect the society. And therefore, there is a contrast with regards to what they view to be the importance of call out culture. At this point in the debate, right, I would say both teams just assert this. So it's uh, it would be quite hard, at least for me, to decide on which one is the most important metric. So that's why on the outcomes clash, at least, I'm a bit, sorry, on the issue that Martin and previously raised, which was to say that opposition is more reliant on the efficacy of call-out culture. Um, at this point, I'm a bit undecided still because neither team has actually given me reasons as to why their metric or their con conception of what makes call-out culture effective is the one that we ought by or ought by more buy into more. It's a sense at an assertion level where either team give us equally plausible um, reasons or plausible metrics of success, but no one re really actually like says, here's why the other side's metric is incorrect. So that needs to play out a bit more in the debate, at least for me personally. I just um, um, I quickly wanted to add that that's a really good point in that. So prop says education is the metric, op says stopping them in the short term out of the public eye is the metric. At this point, neither of them says which is the more important metric, but you could conceive of the world of a world where a, a later speaker might say that. I, I don't actually know if they do. But for example, if prop says education should be the metric because this stops people from committing that harm in a long-term sense, and so that's more important. Or if op says stopping them right now is more important because that gives minority people to the ability to speak out louder, make themselves known, make their problems visible and known, and that stops people even in the long term. Whichever it is, could be said, but hasn't. And therefore, we don't know which is the more important metric. But I just wanted to add that even if you don't know which is the more important metric, you can have an evaluation of who meets their metric better. So for example, at first stop, does OP prove 
that people actually stop when you call them out? Relative to at first prop, does prop prove that people are actually educated when you call them in? And those are still questions that you can ask to decide, even if the metrics are equal, whoever meets their metric better might be better off at the end of the first two speeches. I'm sorry to have interrupted you there, Eric. No, no uh, that's very useful. Uh, Severino, do you have a question or would you like to add on to? Ah, uh, yes, um, no, I have a question. So how would both teams justify their own metric without falling back on their own framing? So for example, how would side opposition justify their metric of societal harm without going on to say, oh yeah, it better benefits minorities because that's framing? Or, so, would, or, or do they not have to do that? So I think this could be done in, well, I think they will have to do that. I.e. they would have to prove why their metric is the one that we, the first is on perhaps weighing why it is the case that your metric matters more. And for example, there's an attempt at this in O1, which is largely a one liner, but before going to the substantive, they say minorities are the most important because they are the ones who have been historically oppressed and denied or mistreated. And therefore, because of that, the team that benefits them the most is the team that uh, should win this debate. If they are able, or if you as a judge believe that they are able to prove that they do benefit minorities and you also by their framing that minorities are the most important in the debate and they are able to mechanize why it is, they're able to mechanize why it is that color culture is the best at protecting minorities than you could give it to them. The second way is to see if the team is able to point out that their metric is analytically prior to that of the other side. So for example, if proposition was able to say, yeah, we also want to protect minorities, but in instances that we prove to you that call-in culture, which as we envision, will lead to more education and more people being receptive to that education. It would mean that we protect minorities because the outcome of people being more receptive to that is them doing things like or to say, prove why your metric encapsulates the metric that the other team wants to push for it as well. Um, I hope that's clear. Yes. Uh, Bashi, do you have anything to add on that? Or would you proceed? No, that's, um, I agree with that as well. And just pointing out that just because they have to rely on their framing doesn't mean they can't rebut each other's framing and explain uh, why their framing is the more real. Sorry, uh, you're breaking up. Sorry, I was just saying. I think it is perhaps lagging, but I think we got to agreed. So I'll take Hamza's hand. Hamza, do you have a question? Uh, yes, I have a question. So like, um, there are two different principles that are being presented by both the teams, but there is this like, uh, both those principles are not directly contracting with each other. And like, there is less engagement on uh, from either of the side of the conditioning. But opposition presents a principle which says that, you know, it is important for minorities to express their anger because that somehow leads to their catharsis. But, but that was largely their principle that minorities should have, uh, you know, the right to express their anger. So these two principles, are explained by both the teams, but like uh, both the teams are not engaging with the principle that is presented by the other side. So how do uh, like go about it, like yeah. weighing those two principles that are not directly contradictory to each other? So the first thing, I should let that record. Yeah, um, the first thing would be to try and find uh, at least implicit ways in which the teams do try to attack the other teams like principle or argument. So in this debate, I think the O1 actually quite explicitly says that we do punish people for things that are outside of their control or for like uh, preconceptions all the time, the same way we would punish individuals for crimes even though they
they are like neurodivergent. So they do try to directly engage with the principal on the proposition. It's not it's certainly expansive. I think it's merely an assertion, but you would try to find those kinds of things, right? Are there instances where even at least possibly the team has some sort of reaction or response to make sure that the other side presents, either explicit or implicitly? The second, following on from that, you'd want to track the evolution of that. So if in the second exchanges, for example, the P2 is able to hammer back down on why it is the case that we shouldn't be uh, punishing like individuals for things that are outside of their control, such as their socialization, it, even in the instances in which that even to the extent that the opposition says we, should, we do do this in other instances, while that is not analogous to this particular instance, then that's something that you'd want to track. Or if on the opposition bench, they're able to expand more on that idea about how why we do punish potentially want to track. Um, the second thing that you would then do in instances where there is no, like completely no implicit or explicit uh, engagement, which is highly like unlikely, but also undesirable because hopefully the teams are telling you the metrics of evaluation within your argument and why it is important, how you outweigh that. The way in which you can go about that is looking at in, in which instance is there like, I guess, greater team consistency for lack of a better phrase. So even if the team does not fully mechanize why their principle is more important, you can try to conceptualize a world in which, or you can try to conceptualize the world in which like you as a, an average reasonable voter would find something to be more compelling and the reasons as to why that might be the case. This does straight into the realm of inserting yourself. So you want to do this only in the most extreme instances. Perhaps you want to maybe wash out the clash and say, okay, there's two equally plausible material here. No team tells me why we should weigh this. So I think this clash is a wash or this clash is not the most important deciding factor. Are there other clashes that you can base your decision on? So do you try to ensure that you are covering the, you are tracking the interactions, even if they are implicit, but secondly, you are also trying to evaluate what are the other match, other exchanges in the round that could help you come to a decision if there is a clash that is completely unengaged by either side, which is highly unlikely or at least desirable in the instance that it does happen. And you'd probably want to uh, penalize this. Okay, so that would be on, so at this point, there are two clashes in the debate. There is the clash on principle, whether or not we should be punishing individuals in this manner, where in proposition, I think posits three things, that there is a lot of anger, individuals probably are doing this out of ignorance and therefore do not deserve punishment. And lastly, that you do not fulfill the aim of changing the views of individuals. The opposition says, actually, it's not always angry. There is a spectrum of the way of the way in which color culture can play out. Secondly, they say these are not always ignorant individuals. Oftentimes, this is from a place of malice. And lastly, they say that even if it is these individuals who are ignorant, we should prioritize prioritize the removal from the public arena so that we can ensure public safety. The second clash is on outcomes, where in proposition broadly argues that you don't change views. Instead, what you do is a, you silence those views in public, and this leads to a banding together and a polarization from users who hold these problematic views. Opposition says, no, we remove them from public, but the minorities are safer. At this point, I would personally say that I think the Opposition is slightly ahead on the idea of what is called a culture, just because I buy more the, the spectrum at which they're willing to engage with it. And I do think they engage throughout, to, like, throughout the breadth of that spectrum, whereas, whereas the proposition case seems to be lying or reliant on individuals who are acting not out of malice, but because they were socialized and they have no other avenues of that education. Opposition says we, the, the victims should not have to educate these individuals and we can be proportionate in our response. It's not always, and uh, it's not always, even in the POI exchange, riding to the level of physical intimidation. With regards to outcomes, I think proposition is ahead, just because I think proposition does a lot more in terms of proving why it is the case that there is going to be this banning together, this leads, which leads to less desirable outcomes in the form of individuals being less receptive to criticism and also individuals being highly polarized, which can lead to further harm on towards the minorities. Opposition says minorities are safe on their world, but they don't really prove this. So now it will be up to you as a judge to decide who is like ahead holistically in the round. Do you weigh more the principle or the characterization of what color culture actually is? Or do you weigh more the 
outcomes of that and what are the reasons for that and then you can justify why you would believe that the proposition or opposition is ahead at this particular juncture in the debate and of course track the evolution of these clashes okay um at this point we'll then move back to the conferral uh judges sorry conferral judging system and the slides that Vashni has already shared and we'll go through that okay so how to do conferral and now here you'll be confirmed with your panel in order to make your final decision this is the bulkiest chunk of the time that you will be spending in the conferral process so the first thing is you want to use this as an opportunity to clarify any questions that you may have about the debate so these clarifications are largely in would largely fall in two um categories the first, uh, I would say technical clarifications. Here you're asking about the rules of WSCC itself and whether or not something is permissible given the rules of the game. So if point X was made for the first time by the third speaker, are we allowed to credit this? I'm unsure. I think this would have a significant bearing on my decision, but I just don't know if I should credit it or was that too late? Those are the kinds of questions that you could ask. Or can team opposition run, the count, run a counter model in a prefers motion? Or are they constrained to the counter fact, sorry, to the comparative that the motion states, right? Those are the technical questions that you can ask during this conferral period in order to clarify what necessarily is it that is allowed in debating or in the WSCC debate format. The second category of questions that you can ask are about more subjective elements of the debate round. So here it will be questions attempting to ascertain or clarify what happened in the, de in the debate, right? Uh, here you may try to double check things that you already have down on your notes, but you are uncertain of if you actually heard the point correctly, or you, you may want to ass assess certain things such as like how to evaluate certain close contentions in the round. So in the debate that we just watched, for example, or at least in the first two speeches that we just watched, a question that could come up is, does opposition actually respond to the proposition principle, I missed this response? And someone, as I did, could point out the idea that, well, there were responses that came from O1, at least to the extent of, uh, of that we do punish people for certain things that are outside of their control in other instances, therefore that would be applicable here. So here you are trying to get more, uh, yeah, here you're trying to get them to, you're trying to get more information about what actually transpired in the debate. The second thing that happens during the conferral process is a process of identifying and tracking issues as a panel. So the chair will largely facilitate this discussion, but essentially the aim here is that once you are well, by the end of this discussion, you want to arrive to sort of the two or three main clashes or important issues that played out in the debate. And here you want to have a an understanding, an understanding as a panel and to understand the quality and the closeness of the round through these questions. So for example, you may say statements such as, I thought there were X important questions or issues in the round. Does anyone have additions to this? So typically the chair would say, I think there were two important issues in this debate. The first is on whether or not we are, princip we are principally justified in implementing X policy. The second is on what will be the outcomes of this. If you have a different evaluation or a different clash that you think does not fall under, the, under these two questions, this would be the time you would raise this so that the whole panel is on the same page with regards to what are the issues in the round. Or other, other the question that might come up at this point is how close was this round? Do you think it was average, above average, or below average overall? This would also help you with like the calibration of perhaps speaker scores. But again, that is a minor discussion in the conferral process. You don't have to arrive to the same like valid or the same speaker scores for the speeches, right? This, this is just for you to help gauge whether or not everyone is on the same page with regards to the debate that has transpired. And then lastly, it would be to evaluate your decision based on the new information and perspective that you received. L listen to the discussion, check your notes. Are you persuaded against your initial call? Do you still have your final? Or do you still, how are you rather like enforced or reinforce your initial call and make a decision then considering the new information that comes from the panel discussion? Okay, and then we can move on to the next slide. Okay, important guidelines for all judges during this conferral process. The first one is that you should enter this discussion with openness and an open mind. So 
avoid being obstinate or willing to listen to what the other judges are saying. And this is all especially important because there is sometimes a misconception that it is not a good thing as a judge for you to change your initial decision. Uh, and maybe you might think that, oh, I will be scored down in my judge feedback if I look like I was not willing to change. There is no such thing. The process of judge feedback is, of qual is a qualitative one, i.e. what is the quality of your reasoning. And so if you're changing decision in light of new information that changes your view of the debate, that is more than justified and that is more than permissible. That is the entire, per the entire point of this process. So if you feel that additional information persuades you or changes your view of the debate, allow yourself to be persuaded and allow that to be reflected. If it doesn't, that's also still fine. You don't have to reach a consensus as has been reiterated at various points at this stage. So just ensure that you are actually open-minded and willing to listen to the other takes from the judges. The second thing is that you should try to be as specific as possible with your questions. So the asking for clarifications that I've just mentioned, it's not for you to rehash or replay the debate. So it's not for you to ask, you know, what was the P1 saying? I did not catch anything. You want to ask for clarity that is targeted and specific and not just an open-ended question. So instead of asking something like, what did the second speaker say in their second argument? You instead want to say, here's what I got from that second speaker argument. Am I missing anything? So there were three levels. I got the first and the second. What was that third level? Or something like that. As specific as possible would help the discussion time be kept to a minimal and also it helps the panel be more effective and efficient with their deliberations or their conferral. The third thing is that to ensure that you're using language that makes space for and facilitates discussion. So phrase your sentences and your contributions in a manner that indicates that you are merely sharing your opinion rather than sharing an objective fact or an objective truth. So avoid saying things such as there's no way this, this team won or this is such an obvious win for this other team, right? You want to say, I think that the proposition wins for these reasons, as opposed to saying, Opposition, there's no world in which the opposition wins this debate. You want to come across as if you have an authoritative and objective view of the debate. Rather, you are merely sharing, you, you're sharing and contributing your view and your takes on the debate. The fourth thing is to spend more time on the contentious issues or the most important areas. So we have a very tight schedule and there are time constraints that need to be uh, adhered to for all comms sake, for the sake of participants, you know, getting to sleep at reasonable times and all of these other logistical reasons. So these time constraints exist and due to that, all participants are expected to spend a majority of the discussion on clear and specific areas that are more difficult to evaluate and matter more to the overall decision of the debate. Rather than areas that the judges broadly agree on or may have contention, but these contentions are not as important to deciding who wins the eventual round. So if all the judges decide that X team wins on the principal clash, for example, but what is unclear is whether or not that principal clash outweighs the more practical clash that the other team wins on. You want to spend more time on discussing why we should value either the principal or the practical more because that's the most contentious as opposed to rehashing why you all agree that X team wins on the principal. Um, focus your time and use it where it's most, ne most necessary and required. And then the fifth and last guideline here is to avoid arguments or heated back and forth. So be cons always be aware that you're in a conferral process rather than a consensus, consensus process. So here you want to receive information that will enhance your own personal decision making. It's not for you to convince other individuals that you are more correct than them. And therefore the point of this exercise is not for you to consistently go back and forth with each other with regards to who is more right and who is wrong. Maybe have one person from other side share their views and then proceed on to another key area for discussion. Okay, thank you. Uh, next slide. After you've had the conferral process, you are now going to move on to filling in your ballots independently. This should take you about three to four minutes. So uh, this should be again done individually and it's a fairly short process. Scores and categories such as content, style, and strategy become most relevant at this point. So these have already been explained, but you want to score the speeches according to these criteria and review the performance of each team and assess scores to each, uh, 
the scores of each speaker. So importantly here, rather than just rigidly seeing them as discrete elements, these three are mutually reinforcing errors that have a judge score a particular speaker within a debate. So don't be too robotic in your approach to the scoring. Uh, as was mentioned, the speaker score is a mathematical expression of your decision and your view of your debate and not the other way around. So you first want to decide on who wins the debate for you and then assign scores relative to that to reflect that, as opposed to first assigning out speaker scores and then saying, oh, well, whichever speech ends up, or whichever team ends up with the most high scores is the one that wins. It should be done with first the reasons why you think a team won and then represent that through with speaker scores. Uh, the important thing, again, to remember here is that low point wins are not allowed. So where one team scores higher than the other, uh, the team that scores the highest should be the team that you believe to be the one that won the debate. If you write down your speaker scores and when calculating the total, they indicate that team A won, but you honestly think that team B should win because they're overall more convincing and did a better job, then you should review your scores um, just to make sure that your scores reflect your decision. At the same time as well, scores are also an expression of your perspective on the quality of the round. So you can award the highest speaker score to someone in the losing team to reflect the quality of their speech. If that speech in and of itself was a good one, just not enough for the whole team to win against the other team. And given that WSCC is a tournament in which speakers are also competing for things such as individual speaker awards, you're also encouraged to do this, to differentiate between individual speakers down the bench and to ensure that your scores are a fair expression of the quality of their speech and that you are rewarding or penalizing speakers as justified per the quality of the speech that they gave. Uh, with regards to scoring, their theoretical range is 0 to 100 for a constructive speech and a 0 to 50 for a reply, but this is restricted by the rules to 60 to 80 for substantive speeches and 40 to, 30 to 40 for replies. And realistically, speakers would go between 64 and 76 or a 32 and a 38 in replies. With regards to scoring, we have done a separate video on this as well. So this would be something that I would direct you to at this point, which was the video on tracking and scoring, which we've also released publicly. And it goes into a lot more detail on how to ascertain like the correct or the, sorry, not the correct, but the appropriate margin or the appropriate um, scale of the speakers of speak, of speaker scores to assign to a particular speaker. So you can also refer to that video to reinforce um, your understanding of scoring and filling in ballots. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Okay. Um, the one thing to raise up here would be on the POI adjust, uh, adjustment column. So POIs are a vital part of the debate and as such, they also can be reflective of what is the quality of a particular speaker's contribution in the round. So you want to track the POIs asked and also reward speakers who ask good POIs in the POI column. So everything that happens within the eight minutes of a speech is marked within the three categories of style, content, and strategy. Therefore, answers to POIs should also be factored into these three categories. So if someone asks a speaker who's currently at the podium a, or is currently speaking a particularly good POI in your view, and they're able to also deal with that particularly well and either avoid a contradiction or avoid their team being backed into a corner, for example, you want to award them for strategy. That happened within the eight minutes of their speech. Content that happens outside of the speaker holding the floor speech is therefore marked within the POI adjustment column only if it is necessary to do so. And here you can award or penalize up to two points. So either give plus two, up to plus two points or subtract up to minus two points. So this is now with regards to the speaker who is offering the POI or the speaker who is responding to the POI because this would be happening outside of the eight minutes of their speech. POI adjustments, however, can only punish or reward speakers based on whether they're, they're already very below average or highly above average respectively. So i.e. you adjust the speaker's score if the quality of the POI is significantly different from the quality of their speech. If a speaker gave you a below average speech and then asks a below average POI, you should not reflect or readjust their speaker scores because those both the speech and the POI are of a similar quality. And conversely, a speaker that gives a very high quality speech and then also a very good POI that's particularly damaging to the other side, you would not reward that. 
So in instances where a speaker gives a below average or maybe an average speech, but then gives you an exceptional POI, those are the instances where you can perhaps use your discretion to give one more point in a POI adjustment column or two more points and vice versa. So the converse would also be true for high quality speeches, but very poor POIs. There has to be a distinction in the quality of the POI and the substantive speech in order for you to use the POI adjustment column. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, so just so I understood correctly, um, yes. you use the POI adjustment column only when there is contrast between the quality of the speech and the quality of the, quality of the POI. That is correct. Okay. Um, the other slides were on scoring, which again we, has been covered in a in another video. Uh, now we're going to go into the last part, which is oh the part towards the oral adjudication. So first, how do you prepare to deliver an OEA? Unlike other formats, such as Asian parliamentary, for example, only one panel, only one member of the panel will deliver the OEA. And this OEA has to be reflective of all of the opinions from the judges uh, who were in the panel. So in most cases, the chair judge will be the one to deliver the oral adjudication to the teams. However, where there is a split and the chair is perhaps the splitting dissenting judge, they may request a member from the majority to deliver the OA. It's up to the chair's discretion, i.e. if the chair feels that the split was justified or amicable and they are still able to represent the views of the majority of the panel, even though they were the ones who were dissenting, they may still deliver the OA. But if they feel uncomfortable delivering the OA, that they do not agree with, then they may also re request from a member of the panel who is in the majority to deliver that oral adjudication. Make sure that your OA factors in the dissenting views of the other uh, judges. So take note during the entire conferral process, which is the chunkiest part of this of the judging uh, the judging process. Take note on what other other members of the panel are saying with regards to what would um, decide the win or the loss of the debate. And then you can also request judges on your panel to provide you with any key points of divergence so that you frame your OA to cover this. So maybe after everyone has submitted their ballot, you can ask when you know who, what are individual's final, uh, final like calls, you may ask say anything that you think is very important that I should definitely reflect in my oral adjudication, for instance, just to make sure that you are being as reflective as possible. Okay, next slide. Now, this is on being able to actually deliver the OA. Again, only one member of the panel delivers an OA that is reflective of everyone's views on the debate. With regards to delivery of the OA, the first thing that we would say that you do is to announce the decision. So there's no need to try and be suspenseful. It oftentimes detracts from, from the debaters actually listening to you because they are so caught up on what it is that was the eventual result that they don't take in your oral education as, um, as attentively as they otherwise would have. So no need to try and be suspense, suspense, suspenseful. First reveal the call, was it unanimous? Was it a split? The second thing to note is that you want to keep your OA within eight minutes and also do not reveal any speaker scores, even though speakers may ask you to do this. You do not have to reveal speaker scores. Um, you also do not have to announce the best speaker of the debate, which are sometimes questions that come up. So within your OA, it is just a reflection of the clashes of the debate and the team's cases uh, with regards to those clashes. You do not reveal speaker scores or best speakers or anything of that sort. The third thing to note is that you want to keep your OA within eight minutes. And in, within these eight minutes, you want to walk the teams through the tracking of the debate and its interactions, rather than just giving them a list of the arguments that were made. So why are specific issues in the debate more important than others? Uh, you want to articulate reasons as to perhaps why are there issues, if there were issues that were equally important, or if there were issues that were more important than and give justifications for why the panel weighed them as such which team won on the specific issues and why. So it's not a play by play where you go, P1 said one, two, three things, O1 said one, two things, P2 said four things, uh, O2 said three things. You do not want to do that sort of back and forth ping pong kind of format. You want to synthesize clashes and evaluate the importance and the extent to which those clashes fit into your overall decision and why. 
The next thing is to always ensure that you are comparative throughout, these, throughout the OA, so what points? So for example, points of argumentation, points of style and strategy, we're more persuasive on the winning side, as well as giving an explanation of the strengths and weaknesses of teams uh, so that you're always comparative. And this way you are giving the due diligence to the speakers that you actually followed the, the, their speeches and what they were contributing to the round. Be as specific as possible. Do not resort to gener generic phrases like X team provided more analysis or they're more persuasive, et cetera. Instead, you want to give specific points of reference as to where this analysis was more uh, was observable or where is this like more persuasiveness was observable from the other team. So you can say, I think proposition was more persuasive, but here are three reasons why they were more persuasive. Do not just leave it at they were more persuasive. Try to spend an equal amount of time on both the teams so that you are also being as balanced as possible and be both and give both positive remarks as well as constructive criticisms to both teams so that it doesn't look like it is a one-sided oral adjudication that just says, oh, proposition had these amazing points, opposition did not refute them, and that sort of thing. Balance the positives and the constructive criticism across both teams. Be very mindful of your language. So do not make offensive comments. Do not make fun of certain speakers. Uh, be respectful at all of at all the time through at all times. And also when you're explaining the decision, stick to what happened in the debate. So do not insert yourself and say, here is the argument that I would have given or the analysis I would have given to make this opposition point more strong. Uh, you want to save that for your constructive feedback to the speakers. You do not insert that into your oral adjudication. Okay, next slide. And then finally, constructive feedback for the teams and speakers. This should be about 15 to 20 minutes. This is the last quarter of the one hour long um, conferral process as explained in earlier slides. So in this time, you want to take on the role of an adjudicator and not necessarily just an unbiased average reasonable voter judge, which is how you view the debate. So instead here, what you want to do is do things such as provide suggestions for how you would have approached the motion or specific arguments or responses you might have run. Um, this could be useful for the teams, but again, it's not a necessity uh, because coaches and teams, or rather teams and coaches should not be expecting this from judges. You can just say why it is that your pattern to me is not uh, as persuasive or as strong in the round, but you can, and it is a nice thing to do to give any sort of specific pointers that you may have that you may have to the teams. So just to teams how to prioritize their material more. So maybe there was an important argument that they left out or that only got maybe 60 seconds in the second speaker speech, which you think could have been analyzed a bit more. Provide more in-depth feedback per speaker, what they did well, what they can do better in the next round. You also want to adjust your feedback to the speakers. So knowing where to pitch your feedback is also important. So if this is a team of novices, you do not want to overload them with something with like complex comments. So you do not want to tell them, you know, there was the, uh, you don't have the epistemic access to make this argument or this argument was symmetric. Try to ensure that your feedback is geared and pitched at the appropriate level for the speakers with which you are dealing with. Do not also single out individual speakers for doing poorly and ladle all of the criticisms onto them. And also, and maybe by the same token, do not ladle all of the positives on another speaker. So don't say your speech is the reason why the team lost the debate. That's quite demoralizing. It's also quite hurtful for a child to hear. So do not do that. Provide teams with an opportunity to ask you any questions that they may have. One of the things that is also probably useful is after you've given feedback on each individual speaker, you can ask, does this make sense? Do you have any questions? And then proceed on to the next one so that you can be taking questions as and when they arise from the teams. And also be nice and compliment each speaker when you can. You are here to be you know, an educator. So help them, motivate them, do tell them what they do well and give constructive criticism. Do not try to break down the children, okay? uh next slide oh is that it okay that brings us to i believe the end of this presentation so if there are any questions uh
we can take them out. Okay. Are there any questions? Anything which is unclear? Uh, the one thing I will say is we've got this in inordinate detail in the debater and judge briefing document. The tracking stuff we have done again in a lot of detail in um, Eric and Daniel's video that's on the YouTube channel. And then we've done conferral in more detail as well, which is in, uh, in the introduction to conferral judging video on the YouTube channel. So I would definitely recommend that if you feel unsure about any of this to just quickly um, skim through one of those. And tomorrow, because we have a number of delays on the judge test submissions, we will also release a video on what the conferral discussion itself looks like. So the, using the judge test video, so those could all be um, useful resources to look at if you've got any questions. Okay. Um, perfect, I know we've kept you longer than we said we would and uh, I know we've got hypotheticals that some of you were interested in and because we've taken uh, significantly more of your time, we will email those out to you and then you can feel free to write back to us asking uh, if your answers are right, if you want to try them on your own, but please, please feel free to drop off and we will see you very, very soon at um, Judge Briefing and then at WCC. So Thank this you. is it for today? Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much. Yes, thank you. I really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you very much. All right, um, Eric, I'm just stopping the